I bet you've had a burning desire to program your FPGA over Wi-Fi, haven't you? I mean, who hasn't? So stick around because today using an ESP-01 Wi-Fi module and the Raspberry Pi Pico, we're going to create a JTAG programmer that will use the Xilinx Virtual Cable Driver and allow us to program directly from impact over Wi-Fi. Sort of. Hello and welcome to 100 Random Tasks. I'm your host, Philip Lett. And if you like what you see here, please give us a like and leave a comment. And subscribe if you want to be notified when more videos are uploaded. And it would really help the channel. I've been using this parallel port programmer based on the Xilinx application note that I've been selling on my website for quite some time. And it has worked flawlessly for me. The problem is that the parallel port is pretty much obsolete these days. And you'd be hard pressed to find one on any new PCs. My lab PC is ancient, it's circa 2010, and it has a parallel port, which is why I still use it. But eventually, I'll need to replace it so I don't need to worry about the problems of Windows 10 on older hardware. I'm looking at you, Windows Automatic Updates. Recently, I picked up a couple of these Raspberry Pi Pico microcontrollers, and was thinking about what I'd like to do with them. If you've never seen these before, it's the Raspberry Pi Foundation's foray into the microcontroller market. With dual Cortex M0 cores at up to 133 MHz, 264K of RAM, 16 MB of external flash, 30 general purpose I.O., dual dedicated UART SPI and I2C, 4 channel 12 bit ADC, 16 channel pulse width modulator, real time clock, and a USB 1.1 host slave ability. All that on this board for less than 6 bucks. And it can run MicroPython. For the record, this video isn't sponsored in any way. So in light of my Create Your Own CPU in an FPGA series, I thought it would be interesting to see if I could create a programmer for the more modern era, and it would give me an excuse to finally learn this Python that all the kids are talking about. In order to get the Pico to run MicroPython, it first needs to be flashed with the MicroPython image. This is easy to do, and it's just a matter of copying the image to the Pico. When I first plugged it in, it registered as a mass storage device, and it was a matter of dragging and dropping the image into the folder. When you do this, it automatically updates and reboots. If it doesn't register as a mass storage device, then you'll have to hold down the boot button when you plug it in and you should see it come up. Now, if you have the serial terminal open with the correct COM port, you'll see the familiar Python prompt and you are ready to go. I'll leave a link in the description where you can get the MicroPython image and it describes the installation process as well. With that complete, I soldered on a couple of headers and connected the Pico to the Wi-Fi module using UART0 and also connected the reset line of the Wi-Fi module to a GPIO and the enable line high. The Wi-Fi module uses AT commands to communicate, and I won't go into the details of using it here as there are plenty of resources online at your disposal with a quick Google search on that topic. On the JTAG side, I picked four GPIOs and connected them to a Spartan breakout board that I have. Then began the process of tearing my hair out learning the nuances of Python. The official documentation uses Thani for the IDE, but you can also use Visual Studio Code with the Pico Go extension if you prefer, which is what I use. The code has three sections. The main code that controls all the action, the ESP8266 object that controls the Wi-Fi actions and is a modified version of a library I found, and a JTAG object that controls all the JTAG actions. The link to the original Wi-Fi library is in the description. Both the ESP and JTAG modules need to be uploaded to the Pico and if you want to have the software run automatically when powered up, then the main module needs to be uploaded as well. When the Pico sees main.py file, it automatically runs it at startup. Occasionally it will fail when connecting to Wi-Fi, so just reset it and it should work. You know it's connected when the LED on the board turns on. I won't go into all the details of the code, but I will take a moment to quickly talk about how the Xilinx virtual cable works. I'll leave a link to my code in the description, but don't crucify me on it. It's not perfect and still has a few bugs. Coding isn't new to me, but Python is, and I'm sure there are plenty of things to improve. The virtual cable uses only three commands, get info, set tck, and shift. Get info is used to tell impact what version of the cable to use, as well as the packet size. Set tck is set to the JTAG clock period in nanoseconds. And the shift command is the information to send to the device and is the only one that we need to worry about. I'll put the link to more information on the protocol in the description if you are interested. The command looks like this. NumBits is always 4 bits in size and in little endian format. 
For those that don't know, if the receive value is this, in that order, the actual number is this in hex, or 5 decimal. This value is the number of bits to shift into the device. Next are the bit values to shift into the TMS line and is received from impact in whole bytes. Meaning that if the num bits value doesn't divide evenly by 8, it will put the partial bits as a byte with the unused bits to be ignored. For the example of 5 bits above, the TMS will be 1 byte in length. If num bits were 32, TMS would be 4 bytes in length, with the least significant byte first. The TDI vector is the bit values to shift into the TDI pin and has the same format as TMS. Here is the example that Impact sends to reset the device. This says to shift 5 bits into the device with TMS being 1 for every bit and TDI being 0 for every bit. The response to any shift command is the value shifted out of TDO and will be the same number of bytes as TMS in the TDI vectors. For the reset above, that usually is 1F in hex. With the basic idea covered, I've started up the program and you can see that the Pico reports it's ready to go. The LED indicates that it is ready to go as well for when the USB is not connected. I'm going to use the 4-bit counter example from part 1 of the custom CPU series as a test. So I connected 4 LEDs and 2 buttons, one for the clock and one for the clear. Next in impact, double click the boundary scan and then the cable setup under the output menu. In here, select the cable plugin and use the following command. Set the IP address to the address of your Wi-Fi module. The program reports this address at startup. Disable version check will tell Impact to use version 1.0 and not bother asking the programmer. And the max packet size limits the maximum data to send to 512 bytes. The Wi-Fi module I have only has a buffer of about 1400 bytes. By setting it to 512, Impact will send a maximum of 1030 bytes at a time. 512 for TMS, 512 for TDI, and 6 for the command shift colon. Click OK and the LED should start flashing as Impact connects. Impact will always send data even when idle in order to maintain the connection, so the LED should constantly flicker. Next, I'll initialize the chain. And it finds the Spartan. Now I'll select the 4-bit counter program and program it. Impact will do its thing and report success. Now if I press the clock button, it should start counting. If I press the clear button, it sets the count to zero. Everything looks good. You'll notice though that this took over 60 seconds. There are two reasons for this. The first is that the Wi-Fi module is working at 115-200 baud, meaning it can transfer 11.5 kilobytes per second. The programmer receives somewhere around 118 kilobytes of data, Plus it has to send about half that amount back in responses. So the total data transfer is 176 kilobytes of data. At 11.5 kilobytes per second, it takes about 15 seconds to do those transfers. On the other end is the time it takes to send the bits to the device. The JTAG uses bit banging and the fastest it can toggle a pin is about 38 kilohertz from what I measured. Doing that math, 118 kilobytes of data at a rate of 38,000 bits per second is 24 seconds for a total of 39 seconds. This doesn't include any time that MicroPython uses to do all the behind the scenes work, which accounts for the remaining 25 seconds or so. The Pico does have something called a programmable IO block, which can send data very quickly, which I also took a crack at, but the end result was it taking over twice as long to finish, even though JTAG data was being sent to the device at 10 megahertz. It has the potential to speed up the JTAG side considerably, but the code needs work to be efficient. The documentation on the PIO was not fantastic and I had to find several different sources and experimentation just to get an idea of how it works and getting it to run as is. I can see making a future blog post or video to try and explain the PIO in simpler terms to save others time and frustration. Now for the caveat. Remember at the beginning I said that it works sort of? 
Turns out there is a bug in impact that the virtual cable won't function correctly if there is more than one device in the chain. One device works fine. In fact, I had found documentation of another bug as well, but I didn't see any evidence of it in my tests, so I can only assume that it has been fixed in the version of Impact I'm using. Unfortunately, it's unlikely that this bug will be fixed, as Xilinx no longer maintains this software. It will initialize the chain correctly, but fails to program the device. I started this project in the hopes of using it going forward on my own dev board, but it has two devices, so no dice there. Back to the parallel programmer for now, I guess. Perhaps in the future I'll see if I can use the XSVF file format from Impact instead. I have to admit that this project took a lot longer than I had originally thought, with all the pitfalls encountered, both known and unknown. But that's electronics, and I'm glad I attempted it and will continue to refine it over time and envision this becoming a multi-purpose programmer for other devices in the future. And I hope you learned something. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button to get notified when new videos are uploaded, and it really helps the channel. And if you are already a subscriber, thank you. Your support means a lot. And if you like what I do here, consider becoming a patron to help me make more great content for you to enjoy. Thanks for watching. See you next time.